prepare a four-year special student of molecular biology and biochemistry, mm -hmm. Department of Chemistry and Faculty of Science, University of Columbus, Sri Lanka. Uh, today, I will be interviewing Professor Leif Hamstrom, uh, Professor at Department of Chemistry, and from Laboratory, Physical Chemistry, Upasala University, Sweden. He is one of the leading scientists who engage in the research work about fundamental mechanistic studies related to artificial photosynthesis and photoelectrochemistry. Uh, so, Professor, to begin with, uh, would you please, please give us a brief introduction about your background to science? Uh, was there any influence from your family background? Yes, there was. Uh, both my parents had studied pharmacy. My father worked uh, for, a, for a pharmaceutical company and my mother worked in uh, apothecary. Uh, and uh, there was frequently scientific discussions at dinner table and uh, they were also very curious making observations. I remember when I when I was very small, I was five or six years old, uh, I'd spilled blueberries on the uh, blueberry jam on my clothes. I said, oh, let, let's, let's go into the bathroom uh, to get, get it off. And they, 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 they were putting on soap on and the color changed. I was like, oh, look, yeah, there must be some pH indicator in this. <laughs> and they, they, they were explaining to me what, what this meant when I was six. <laughs> so you can see that they were very interested. They're very curious about uh, the, the natural world around us. And, uh, I think, and they, so I, I think this has inspired me greatly. I'm, I've always been very curious at uh, understanding the world around us from a scientific uh, point of view. And uh, I discussed a lot of mathematics also. My I had an older brother and we used to discuss at dinner table. <laughs> I think this is something very important. Very interesting, uh, Professor. <laughs> uh, Professor, could you please uh, describe about the type of research work uh, that you're focusing in currently? Yes, so, so uh, broadly my research can be described as fundamental mechanism behind artificial photosynthesis, as you said. And uh, artificial photosynthesis builds on the same principles as natural photosynthesis and the aim is to understand those principles and maybe be able to reproduce such a system and possibly such uh, these uh, these research could lead to practical applications where we learn to convert solar energy into chemical energy but in a storable form of a fuel that can be stored much better than than batteries for example electricity in batteries and uh, uh, and this can also be done hopefully on large scale and much more efficiently than plants do. Because plants were not evolved to maximize photosynthetic efficiency or not the biomass, biomass production. The initial photosynthetic steps are, are efficient, but uh, then there are many things that happen that lead to low efficiently, the efficiency of uh, the overall photosynthetic biomass production. So what, what, uh, what I'm working with is a lot of photochemical reactions where light triggers chemical reactions. These are electron tra transfer reactions and proton transfer reactions. And then also how several electrons and protons come together to form a fuel like hydrogen or a carbon-based fuel and water splitting. So um, everything from excited state dynamics to electron transfer, proton couple electron transfer and mechanism of catalysis is what I'm working with. I work a lot with time-resolved laser spectroscopy, but also many other techniques. Uh, yes. Mm. Oh, very interesting. Uh, so what caused you to achieve some great heights in your research work? Mm. This is a very interesting question uh, because uh, breakthroughs are often unpredictable. Uh, it, it's almost by by definition. <laughs> if you already know it's gonna work, it's not a breakthrough. <laughs> but uh, but uh, what is uh, serendipity is very important in research. But it's very important. You cannot just fool around in the lab and don't and take it as an excuse to not think hard. You have to think hard and make sure that you're going into interesting areas and work on interesting problems and phenomena. And you also have to be knowledgeable and very observant. Observant, in the, keep your eyes open in the lab. Think when you're in a lab, observe the experiment, look at, look at it, use your eyes, but also use the tools we have as, uh, uh, as um, experimentalists and keep your eye open for what you did not expect. 
to happen. Because it takes a good scientist to notice if something unexpected uh, comes and also understand the importance of such an unexpected discovery. There are science and nature papers being published that started with a control experiment that failed. But someone was someone had had their eyes and mind open to see that oh this was not just a f this was really interesting it was a control experiment it did not give me the result I thought it would but it showed me something completely different. Okay, uh, uh, Professor, uh, what were the major challenges brought to our scientific career? I think. Uh, it is a it is a daily struggle basically you you have to work hard and uh, be a, and it takes long time i think when i started as I, i've always been very optimistic with time in my life in general and uh, i always think that things would go quicker than i thought so maybe by by two it's two times faster than it actually took and then when i started doing my phd it was a shock because suddenly it took 10 times longer than I thought. <laughs> so, uh, so dealing with these uh, slow time scales, so to say, the, the, the slow progress of research and still, uh, uh, still keeping, uh, keeping uh, energy and, uh, and determination. But I think this is something I've learned. And this is maybe one of my strengths. I, I, can, I can work for a long time on a problem. And I think this is important. If you're interested in making quick discoveries and uh, quick successes, you should probably not work in science. And it's, what is very important is to realize that the long, hard work is part of the successes. Uh, it, is not, uh, it is not 364 nights of darkness and one day of light. The day of light is part of the entire year. When you're when you're building your research, all 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 is part of the whole thing, and you cannot just say that this was slow and unimportant. And here I did the important thing, because you would never have gotten to that important thing if you haven't hadn't spent the time before that gave you the, put you in a position to do that breakthrough. But I think the, 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 this is a general struggle, not just for me, of course, but in, the, in, the, in general. But I don't think I had one major challenge in my research. I think I've been quite fortunate in my research. I had, uh, I liked, what, I've been liking what I've done most, uh, almost every day. I've been happy going to work, uh, which is a privilege. Uh, I've had resources. People have mostly been good to me. I've discovered some interesting things and uh, made friends. So I, I think I, I, I don't complain. I think uh, my, my, uh, my, uh, my work life has been kind to me mostly. Uh, so my next question, uh, Professor, how do you think uh, that your scientific discoveries would be beneficial to this world? See, I work at the university, so I think one of the most important things that I do, or that I can do, is to educate people, undergraduate students, but also PhD students and postdocs that I mentor, and uh, I can also recruit people, so younger colleagues, and I always say that the, if you're a boss, your most important job is to recruit some people that are better than you are, and I think I've succeeded quite well so far. Yeah, so when I retire, there will be an even better department. And uh, but then, then for my research, the actual research, I think it will help people understand the world. And specifically, I hope that uh, the artificial photosynthesis research that I do will contribute to a, a development of artificial photosynthesis uh, for practical use in society, to uh, to phase out fossil fuels and give us a storable large-scale solution uh, for a fuel that is not contributing to global warming. Uh, 
as a prominent scientist who has been engaging in scientific research more than a decade. Professor, uh, what do you think scientists can do to reach out the world about the importance of science? It is a good question. It is, a, it is an important job. It's not always appreciated in academia. Uh, we are not always rewarded for taking that duty. Uh, but I think it's, it's not a simple thing. I think it's, again, like science in general, it's a long, hard and persistent work. And uh, we need to remind politicians about science, what science actually says, and that science actually is important to contribute to knowledge, but also for the uh, give a background for informed decisions. Uh, but also we need to re reach general people because in most countries, the people vote and decide who is going to be the politicians. And if, the, if people want science as a basis for a society, then the politicians have to adopt to that. I think uh, uh, the pandemic, COVID pandemic, has given us an unusual opportunity to reach out about the importance of science, but also explaining a little bit, uh, explaining to some extent how science is made. A new virus comes, per definition it's new. Uh, we don't have at the hospital to say, oh, is this treatment science based? And explain to people, yeah, it's, uh, it's based on, on uh, treatments we have used for other diseases, which we think could be similar, but we don't know. The way you learn is to try. Experiment this is how experimental science advances. And uh, here we have had but, uh, an opportunity to, in real time, explain how science is develop, developing. Uh, climate, uh, the climate, uh, uh, the climate uh, hazard, global warming, is m much more long term. It has been a long struggle for climate scientists to make their voice heard, and it's still not accepted everywhere. But I think most of the people now in the world accept that this is a real threat and global, man-made global warming is reality. And this is very important because it's, it's really a good example how science through persistent and excellent work is able to provide extremely important knowledge that is not evident when you're just walking down the street. Now people can realize and put, see, see patterns and so on, but without this fine scientific frameworks, and people, people would have had no idea why there's so many fires this year. <laughs> yeah. and, uh, and now we actually uh, we have a scientific framework to understand that it urges us to take political and personal action. So I think these two examples are excellent examples of two very different dynamics. One, one very quick and sudden, the pandemic, and then very slow, which is the growth of a, a, a growing awareness of the global warming. So this is good. We should do more of this. Thank you, Professor. Uh, now I'm going to ask a question about some uh, optimistic memory about your asking. So, uh, Professor, throughout your research work, uh, can you please describe one of any exciting incidents that was memorable to you? Yes, I was thinking about this, and uh, and uh, I had to say that some sometimes a student comes in, or a PhD student or postdoc comes in with results, and you see something new. It may have been what you expected. It may not have been uh, what I what you expected. And it's beautiful. But I, I want to take an example from when I was in the lab myself. So I was an assistant professor. No, sorry. No, let me uh, let me correct that. I, I had just finished my PhD, and I was uh, I was uh, one week later. I would go to Italy for a postdoc, and I was instructing two new PhD students on doing. Uh, laser-based experiments where you excite molecules and see how electron transfer happens between them. And this was the very first molecule that we had in a Swedish consortium for artificial photosynthesis that was just established as a collaboration with my group of physical chemists, with a group of synthetic chemists and a group of biochemists at other universities in Sweden. 
And uh, our, our goal was to build models for the photosystem 2 in photosynthesis, that is uh, where you have chlorophylls absorbing light, but also you have a manganese cluster that, split, that splits water to oxygen, protons, and electrons. And we made the first photoactive molecule linked to one manganese. And our goal was to see uh, electron transfer from the manganese to that, uh, that uh, photoactive molecule. And I had already in my head realized, okay, this is what the data is going to look like if, we, uh, if it works. And this is what it's going to look like if it doesn't work. Because we had a control compound where nothing should happen. So I, I showed them this is, how you, this is how you interpret the data. And you can see that immediately on the oscilloscope screen. So this is what it looks like. And say so here you can see this happen, and now this happens. Now we take the real compound. We had to degas for a few minutes and then do the experiment. And it was literally a push of the button, and in a, in a split second, you saw, you saw what happened on the screen. And I could see that it happened. And I had to bite my tongue not to shout because I was so happy. And uh, because I was, I was, uh, I was uh, tutoring them, I was uh, trying to teach them how, how to think. I said, yeah, so what do you think about this? What, what happened now? What, do you see the difference? And, and they were confused at first, and uh, then we re realized that the experiment was a success. So then uh, we went up to and uh, wrote an email to the other members in Sweden of, uh, of our consortium and, and uh, telling about this, uh, this experiment, now this, uh, that it had worked. The, so the, I think this, this is a very, it's a very fond memory of this event from the early days. <laughs> Uh, thank you, Professor. Uh, uh, so, what might be the major areas of chemistry uh, that could have a huge influence to the world uh, from your perspective? Yes, this is a, a chemistry. Uh, when, when, uh, when humans started dividing science into chemistry, physics, biology, and so on, Chemistry use, was the only discipline that actually made what they study. So instead of studying what they found in nature, but now chemistry has, the disciplines are getting more and more mixed and you see uh, chemistry being part of biology, physics, environmental science, uh, material science, etc. So the borders are not as sharp, but um, in, in, on television, of course, you mainly see forensic science in the, <laughs> in the uh, crime scene investigations. But uh, what I think uh, some areas where chemistry will definitely be important in the near future, is already important, is of course medicine, development of new drugs. And for example, tackling the antibiotic resistance is a very important problem. Right now, the world is focused on the COVID pandemic but uh, all the experts are predicting that we will have, in, we already have problems with anti antibiotic resistance. And there's a high risk that our conventional drugs will be in, in, completely ineffective. Uh, new materials and processes in general, we, we, are, we are still a discipline that can make stuff. And uh, we need to make them better. We need to make uh, materials and pro, uh, for for energy for uh, renewable energy, but also for environmentally friendly processes. It could be monitoring the environment. It could be purifying the environment. It could be processes that don't pollute as much, at least. Uh, and it should also be sustainable materials, sustainable materials and processes. And then, of course, for renewable energy transformations, for converting. For example, solar energy to electricity or a fuel, for converting it in fuel cells, uh, for storage in batteries, or for example. So ch chemistry has great roles to play in the, many of the uh, of the major societal challenges we have today: sustainability, uh, energy, global warming, health, and uh, food food and poverty. Uh, next question uh, will be, uh, Professor, throughout your research career, uh, you may have received many honorable awards and prizes for indicating excellence in your work. 
Uh, would you like to share some of them with us? Yes, I would like to just mention two. And uh, the one is, uh, one is from uh, 2001 when I was, uh, I'd just become associate professor. Uh, and uh, it was a new program from a Swedish foundation called uh, the Swedish Foundation for Strategic Research. And they launched a program that was very new in its time, uh, at that time. It didn't exist that type of program before. Uh, this was before European Union had ERC grants, for example. So this was a substantial career grant for young scientists in all areas of science, medicine, and technology. And uh, it was uh, for research leaders for the future. And they had uh, over 500 applicants, and, uh, and there was a two-step process. And uh, at the end of the day, I was one of the 20 who got it. And uh, it was a substantial amount of money for six years, which was a long time, and it gave me a lot of recognition that I was uh, that I was uh, one of the promising young scientists in Sweden, and also helped me with the contacts. And uh, we had uh, very nice meetings to uh, these twenty people from very different areas, uh, discussing leadership and uh, discussing science, uh, and. Uh, the other one I would like to mention is the most recent one, and that was from uh, from 2020, and that's from Inter-American Photochemical Society. So this is uh, from North and South America, uh, photochemists uh, over the both continents. And they had a new presidential award, that, uh, and the first time they gave it out, and uh, I was the recipient, and I get, uh, got to give a award lecture at their yearly meeting. And this was so nice also because it was for a recognition, uh, an international recognition from my peers, my colleagues in the fields. And uh, people outside science often ask about, yeah, so, so are you hoping to get the Nobel Prize? Like we, we, like we are athletes or sports people who always think about the Olympic medals. And I tried to explain that, no, most scientists are, are not even thinking about getting the Nobel Prize. This is not why we are doing this. And I think most of us, what we want is that the, the other people in the field, the people we really respect, we want, we want to show them, look, I've done something good, look, what do you think? And then we want them to like it. I think this is a fundamental driving force. That's why I, I was very happy for that award. Uh, Professor, uh, what be the major challenges in the future that uh, scientists have to face according to your understanding? Mm -hmm. It has always been hard to be a, a really good scientist. Uh, uh, what is um, in recent years, many countries have put a lot more efforts into into the research, and that's why we're having many men, many more scientists. This is of course good, lots of people get the opportunity, but it also means that the competition is higher and there are so many papers being published. So it's hard to keep track. Uh, but how to find, and you may think with so many scientists, how can you find your own research question or do something new? But this is really important in science. If it, if it wasn't hard to find it, it wouldn't be new. It would already be done. Uh, and uh, so, so, so finding good novel ideas has always been hard. So it's not worse than before. So don't, don't give up. You will, find, uh, you will find your research idea if you try. Mm -hmm. uh, how do you manage your time and work efficiently that will allow you to achieve great heights in your field? This is a very good question, and the truth is that I, ma I, I manage it well sometimes, but many times I don't manage it very well. And there are many things that just comes with the job that you have to do, and uh, often, it's often much more than you really have time for. Uh, but uh, the, the, when I manage it well, what I do is that I schedule uninterrupted time, several, several hours at least, half a day, or a full day, maybe even several days in a row 
the, where I can completely shut off everything, which of course includes shutting off uh, emails and, uh, and everything that can distract me so that I have kind of time to work in a concentrated, focused way on something I need to think hard about. It could be research ideas, could be uh, research proposals, could be writing a manuscript and, or something like that. So I, I think uh, you cannot wait for, you can, uh, you can never wait and say, oh, when, when everything is done, then I can sit down and think. There's nothing, you will never come to a situation where everything is done. As a renowned professor, what advice would you give us who pursue scientific research as a career? Yes, I think it's important to believe in yourself, but don't be afraid to seek help from peers and from more senior mentors. So, uh, uh, so ask for advice, discuss, but you, uh, fundamentally you need to believe in yourself. Collaboration stimulates many of us. So uh, for many people, some people are happier if they can think and work on their own, but most people I think uh, are stimulated by collaborations. And this can also be a way where we, ha where we, uh, where we have, to have to formulate our thoughts and it help may help us to sharpen our thinking. And it also, of course, uses the fact that you are at least two brains that can think, <laughs> you and the other person. And uh, I think also um, another advice, make sure that you work in an area that you find interesting. But be be self-critical before you start working on a project. Think for yourself, what, what do I expect to learn from this? If you do something new you've never done before, maybe it doesn't have to be, the, your first project doesn't have to be great, you need to learn. But if you already done five papers on something and planning for the sixth one, you, you think hard and make sure, should I really do this? Is it sufficiently new and different or is it just another one? And if it's just another one, think again. Hmm. Uh, to my next question, uh, Professor, uh, what is your most prominent and uh, valuable scientific discovery in your research career? Yes, I, I was thinking of that and many, it's again, most of research is not just one eureka moment. It is a uh, piece after piece until you're building a picture, a little bit like uh, what I said about climate science is a slow building, but, uh, but also in, in your individual research, it's often uh, brick after brick until you get the house <laughs> and the house grows bigger. And uh, for proton coupled electron transfer, I'd like to think that I made important contributions on the understand, our understanding of that. Uh, but if, if you're thinking about moments where really, there are more moments of discovery, I would say that I, may, I designed a ruthenium complex based on a new type of thinking on how to combine a good structured geometry with good photophysical properties. And it turned out to be out of more many thousand complexes in the literature, it was the best one at the time for that purpose. And uh, this was, in, we published in 2006. And my student at that time had had a hard time during her PhD. And, uh, and finally we had made, because we had tried before, and finally, we had made something that was just spectacularly good. It took her weeks to believe that the result. <laughs> she thought there was something wrong with the result, but it wasn't. Then uh, another one was also when I was even younger was my, actually my first project as an assistant professor where we looked at uh, higher excited, st electronically excited states of porphyrin-like molecules, porphyrin, uh, and um, how you could actually get electron transfer from these short-lived excited states, which eventually led me, led me to make a switch where you can use different colors of light to give electron transfer in different directions. But the first paper was uh, then, uh, the first result was then uh, when I was uh, my first year as an assistant professor, when, uh, when we could, uh, could actually show 
uh, that uh, is very, very short lived, a picosecond or a few picoseconds, uh, was enough to get the electron transfer to another molecule. Hmm. Thank you, Professor. Uh, Professor, uh, why do you think uh, that science is not popular among the uh, general public? I think, I think actually good popular science is popular with, uh, with people, but uh, proper understanding takes time. And uh, I think even if people like to hear about fascinating and stimulating ideas from science in a presented briefly in a popular fashion, uh, really learning about it, studying and working with natural science, it is a slow process. You, do, you cannot come in and uh, work for two years and then go out. I mean, <laughs> if, you, if you pick up the textbooks first time and then two, two years later expect to be done, that is not, uh, th this is not how science works. But if you, if, uh, so that, that's why I think many people are afraid of studying it because it's, they're afraid of a commitment for so many years. But if you think about uh, good musicians or ballet dancers or sports players, uh, they're also, I mean, no one goes into cricket uh, and two years later is, is a world champion, right? It's, they start when they're very young and they work hard and, uh, uh, and play for many years. So uh, it's um, persistence and uh, the, the, the same you need in science. Uh, so Professor, this is uh, my last question. Mm -hmm. uh, uh, so as a Professor, we would like to know some inspirational ideas from you for the ones who are interested in science. Mm -hmm. I would say that uh, work with something, some science that you like, that you, that you, uh, you think is fun and interesting and stimulating. And make, even if you have many duties in your work, make sure that this part that is interesting you becomes part of your entire work. And uh, it will, if you're, if you're a professor or work in, a, work in a high school or working in a university, your science interest will shine through when you teach. And you will use that interest to make better teaching it's more stimulating for you, it's more stimulating for the students. Uh, if you have work meetings discussing uh, administrative duties, I mean, see it as part of planning for the science. So, if you, if you, so, so make, make your interest and your passion part of your daily life. And you will see that, uh, so that when, uh, when, you, when you're a chemist, you have to wash up dishes in the lab. And washing up dishes is part of doing the experiment that led to the discovery. And it will allow me to use clean glassware for the next experiment, which may lead up to the next discovery. So think about it as, as a, uh, in a holistic way, as part of the whole process. Uh, talk to smart and knowledgeable people. Could be both peers and more senior people People who know things, discuss your ideas, listen to their ideas, uh, and uh, it will give you inspiration. It will uh, it will help you focusing on learning, and it will request you to think hard about problems. You cannot you cannot ask a good question if you if you haven't thought about the problem. And again, I say uh, this is part of it: collaboration and uh, is for most people very stimulating. Collaboration could be going up to, uh, to have a cup of tea and discuss with your colleague. Uh, look, you know what happened in my lab? We found this result. I say, oh, interesting. Uh, uh, and then you just exchange idea. But it could also be much deeper. It could be that you sit and plan together for joint research. So collaboration is, it could be uh, on this small level or this very deep level. But it's, for most people, it's very stimulating, and I think it develops our thinking and develops our science. Mm -hmm. uh, thank you, Professor Leif Chemistry. Uh, so let's summarize things up. Uh, today we have interviewed Professor Leif Chemistry, professor at the Department of Chemistry 
angstrom level physical chemistry professor of chemistry three uh, it's a great pleasure professor to engage in this conversation with you uh, i would like to take this moment to thank professor Leif hammerstrom for giving us his precious time uh, amid this busy schedule to educate ourselves about his valuable opinions so i'm going to conclude this session uh, thank you everyone stay safe Thank you very much, Tinuka. And good luck.